Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Akash, and together with, together with my uh, colleague Graham, we'll be giving you a tutorial on uh, federated computation. Uh, this is a framework to incorporate a wide variety of privacy preserving technologies that allow you to train machine learning models and evaluate the results to analytical queries in such a way that is uh, compliant with uh, privacy regulations around the world and also assuages the concerns of users who have uh, sensitivities towards privacy issues. Uh, to set expectations, here's an overview of how the tutorial will proceed. Uh, we'll begin by introducing what federated computation is and justifying its need, uh, following which uh, Graham will talk about the various fundamentals of a system for federated computation. Uh, he'll then deep dive into some of the algorithms to implement these uh, statistical primitives that form the fundamentals of that system, uh, following which I will talk about some practical considerations when you try to deploy such systems in production. And we'll end with a discussion of advanced topics and open problems in this area for those of you with an academic uh, bent of mind. One disclaimer that I'd like to provide is that this tutorial is a survey of published work on federated computation. Uh, even though Graham and I are both uh, employees of Meta, which is formerly Facebook, uh, this does not disclose any non-public information about practices and deployments, and none of the content here should be interpreted as much. Uh, so just uh, putting that disclaimer out there. Uh, and with that, let's uh, dive right in. Um, so we all know that uh, data is a pre precious commodity uh, and has unlocked trillions of dollars in economic value over the course of the past couple of decades. But these days it comes with a catch. First off, uh, lay people themselves are becoming increasingly sensitive to privacy issues surrounding their data. And they've realized that uh, their medical information, their financial information, their personal information, all of this uh, uh, tells others a lot about themselves and they're quite, quite hesitant to hand this over. Additionally, uh, there are a lot of legal protections that have been put in place for such data. For example, GDPR in Europe, EPD uh, and CCPA here in the United States, uh, all of these uh, enforce uh, necessary restrictions on how this data can be shared and collected. Uh, and lastly, companies themselves might want to differentiate their offerings by offering, uh, by giving strong privacy guarantees. Uh, for example, messaging applications might want end-to-end -end encryption, uh, and Apple's iOS 14 update uh, came with uh, an increase in uh, privacy protections. This runs directly in contrary to the fact that modern data applications benefit from being informed by personal data in order to improve the quality of products offered to users. And this is often in the user's best interest as well. So can you have your cake and eat it too? Uh, this is exactly what federated computation tries to do. And the best way to think of it is that it's kind of like MapReduce over highly decentralized data with privacy built in. So what do I mean by that? Uh, I mean that storage is massively distributed, potentially across billions of devices owned by, say, users of some of these large-scale web applications these days. Uh, the compute instructions are sent to where the data lives, as opposed to the data being sent to where the computation happens. Uh, also, users own and keep their own data on their devices. So things like consent, privacy, security are all first-order concerns. Also, since users bring their own devices or nodes, uh, they are highly non-standard in terms of the bandwidth access that they have, the compute and memory capacity, and so on and so forth. Also, these nodes themselves can come in and out of the network, depending on the choice of the user or just a flaky connectivity of the network. And the data on those devices is highly ephemeral, potentially unbalanced, and non-stationary. Now, I say that you can think of this as MapReduce with privacy built in. So what do I mean by that? I mean that we adhere to the following privacy principles. Number one, we gather the least amount of data necessary to perform some uh, particular function. We ensure that whatever data is gathered is gathered for a very specific and limited purpose, and it isn't retained once that purpose has been met. We also enforce strict restrictions on who has access to that data, and we ensure that we only ever store or analyze population level aggregates rather than individual data. Also, we take care to ensure that any data disclosures by individuals should not be traced back to them at any point. And we make use of a uh, randomized response to introduce some level of plausible deniability. In other words, there's uncertainty about the accuracy of each user's data disclosures as a sort of last line of defense. 
Now, in practice, there are different approaches to providing privacy, and there are a lot of different uh, trade-offs uh, to navigate. For example, does your trust model accommodate a, a trusted third party, which can perform some central aggregations? Uh, are we interested in uh, providing statistical privacy guarantees, or you know, are we happy just enforcing access controls and rules? Uh, uh, how are we dealing with longitudinal uh, data studies versus cross-sectional data studies? How do we manage different levels of scale? What sort of granularity of privacy do we uh, give a promise at? So on and so forth. Uh, during the course of this tutorial, we will go through a lot of these issues as well as how to navigate these trade-offs. Now, at the beginning of the talk, I mentioned that uh, federated computation was a framework to incorporate a wide variety of privacy technologies, and hence I call it a buffet of privacy technologies. The best way to illustrate how they figure in is by uh, tracing through, say, one round of each protocol of federated computation. So usually this begins with a server which is in interested in performing some kind of task. This could be training a machine learning model or evaluating the result to some analytical query. And a, uh, the other aspect of this is a bunch of client devices. These could be things like you know, cell phones that are owned by users of some web service, or on a, on a smaller scale, this could be, uh, say, data sets held by a bunch of medical institutions where, which are trying to collaborate uh, to enable research. Uh, but regardless of what this is, especially at, uh, for larger scale deployments, uh, we first sample some subset of the client devices that are available uh, on the basis of some eligibility criteria. So if these are cell phones, it could be uh, that we require them to be on a Wi-Fi connection and plugged into power. The server typically kicks off a task. Like I said, this could be to train a machine learning model or evaluate the result of some analytical query. And this task might require the dissemination of some inputs from the server to each of these sample client devices. Each of these devices then combines those inputs with some data that is strictly on device. So this data never really leaves the device. And this leads us to the first privacy technology, which is that the entire lifecycle of the data is managed on device. Uh, this includes you know, the creation of the data, uh, the sort of encryption of data on this to ensure uh, that you know, attackers can't get access to it, uh, ensuring that data is purged on time in uh, uh, keeping with uh, requir requirements of regulation, so on and so forth. In any case, uh, the, the, the results of this local computation result in some outputs. And these outputs typically need to be disclosed. Uh, and this introduces us to the second privacy technology, which is the use of differential privacy. Essentially, these outputs are never really communicate, communicated as is in the clear. Rather, we choose a strategically uh, chosen amount of noise uh, to obfuscate the true value of this output. This also has the effect of preventing memorization in addition to introducing some level of plausible deniability as to what the actual value was. The same routine is applied on each of the client devices. And this leads us to the third privacy technology, which is the use of federated algorithms uh, that minimize the amount of data that needs to be disclosed by each of these client devices. Uh, we'll discuss some of these federated algorithms later, but in some cases, you can get away with even just disclosing a fraction of a bit of data, which is kind of as good as it gets. Each of these client outputs with the noise added in is then disclosed to an aggregator through an anonymous channel. And this is the fourth privacy technology. Uh, essentially, it prevents each of these reports from being linked back to the device that made it. This aggregator is usually a secure aggregator, and it could be implemented either uh, by using specialized hardware, uh, for example, Intel SGX, or it could be th uh, through the use of secure multi-party computation protocols. And optionally, you could also add noise centrally, kind of like we did on each of these devices, to achieve what's called a central differential privacy guarantee. In any case, the job of this aggregator is to ensure that none of these individual reports from each of the client devices is seen by the server. Uh, rather, what is seen by the server is an aggregate of all of these. And once the server receives this, it can choose to engage in yet another round of this protocol. So to recap, uh, federated, in, in, in federated computation, data remains under the control of each of these client devices, uh, which are typically owned by users. Only a small amount of necessary data is shared with a central server. Communication is done under strong security guarantees, so with encryption 
uh, and additional privacy guarantees are provided via the addition of random noise to provide a differential privacy guarantee uh, through the use of anonymous communication channels and through the use of secure aggregation. Now, federation refers to the fact that data is distributed across devices, but this itself can happen in a number of ways, uh, two ways specifically. The first is horizontal federation. And here, uh, each client's data has the same schema and could pertain to one or you know, a, a few different individual users. So this happens, for example, when uh, uh, each mobile device ho uh, holds an individual's browsing history or some data pertaining to the use of some large scale web service. Uh, and the other form of federation is vertical federation, where each client has data on different features of the same common group of individuals. So think, for example, uh, different uh, hospital uh, departments or, uh, which are, are collaborating to enable some kind of research on some common population of users. Uh, for this tutorial, we focus on the horizontally federated case uh, with the coordinating server involved. So in this horizontally federated scenario, uh, scale becomes uh, one of the central challenges. So the volume of data involved is uh, oftentimes incredibly large, especially when the underlying data itself is, is something like video data, which could be used to train machine learning models, for example. Uh, and it may not be practical, possible, or legal to gather this such data uh, from these many clients centrally. And it's just more efficient to process them where they lie. Uh, moreover, we have to provide strong privacy guarantees uh, in adherence with those privacy principles that I talked about earlier. Uh, another aspect to consider is the scale of the deployment of uh, a federated computation solution. On one end of the spectrum, you have very small scale deployments uh, where you have uh, somewhere on the order of uh, tens of organizations uh, sharing data amongst each other. Uh, so the canonical use case here is hospitals pooling medical data to better understand a disease. Uh, you have medium scale deployments with somewhere on the order of hundreds of organizations. Uh, uh, and here you can think of banks sharing information uh, to find patterns of fraud. Uh, and on the other extreme end of the spectrum, you have large scale deployments with uh, usually millions of entities involved. And these are users of some large scale uh, web service. Uh, an example being uh, you know, uh, an, an app on a smartphone where we're gathering statistics to improve the quality of the app or something like that. Um, so our focus in this tutorial will be on medium and large scale deployments, uh, and additionally, we'll be focusing on uh, analytical workloads rather than machine learning workloads. That itself is a segue to my next point, which is that federated computation is an umbrella term, uh, and there, it usually has two different instantiations. The first of this is probably what's more popularly known, which is federated learning. And this it, it typically deals with training machine learning models over distributed data uh, through rounds of gradient-based optimization. Uh, the other instantiation of federated computation is federated analytics, uh, where we typically are interested in computing some simpler population level statistics, uh, but by accessing the vast majority of the population as opposed to federated learning, where you can get away with sampling some small subset of them. Uh, additionally, federated analytics just tends to be a much lighter workload per device uh, as opposed to federated learning, which can oftentimes impose high requirements in terms of hardware, uh, memory, uh, compute capacity, and battery capacity uh, from each of the devices participating in the federated computation protocol. So as I mentioned before, this tutorial focuses on federated analytics, uh, but we do occasionally touch on federated learning. Uh, for those interested in federated learning, uh, the, the, the slide contains a, a reference to an excellent resource on this. In summary, federated computation can be thought of privacy-preserving MapReduce, where the clients are the mappers and servers are the reducers. And you can uh, conduct computations uh, over collections of users at web scale uh, in keeping with the privacy principles that we talked about earlier. Uh, Prominently, data stays on client devices and only sufficient statistics are shared in adherence of those privacy principles. And uh, privacy guarantees are typically articulated in the form of differential privacy, uh, which we'll define and uh, come to in subsequent slides. Uh, and federated computation has two instantiations, federated learning, uh, which deals with training machine learning models, and federated analytics, which deals with evaluating simpler population level statistics uh, over, over large populations of users. And with that, I'll hand over to Graham, who will talk about some technical preliminaries. <laughs>
unmute myself and we should be ready to go. So thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> just while this is setting itself up. Um, these slides are available online. You can find the link to them uh, from the agenda entry on the web conference, uh, or if you just find the, the website for this tutorial. And if you have uh, questions at any point, please just unmute yourself and, and ask away or use the raise hand button. Uh, and we'll try to pick up any, any questions as we go. So I'm gonna switch gear a little bit and, and go to a bit more sort of technical focus, uh, technical depth on this after that wonderful introduction. Um, so we're gonna start off by talking about some of the privacy and security preliminaries. So often when people talk informally about sensitive data, they use privacy and security almost interchangeably. Here we're gonna make a distinction. Here we're gonna say, well, privacy is about what someone can learn from looking at the output of a computation. And we want to try and constrain that and restrict making inferences about any individual uh, that contributed to the data. And security is, is concerned with protecting information about data while it's undergoing computation. So, so any intermediate values or any raw data will be protected with security primitives. Within the setting of uh, federated computation, there's many different aspects of privacy and security. And over the next few slides, we'll tick through several of these. So different notions of security and different notions of privacy. Um, and each of these gives rise to different models within the federated computation setting that will trade off um, the levels of protection as well as the associated computational costs and the accuracy you can get for the, the tasks that we're trying to solve. So we'll, we'll start with what sort of the original justification for federated computation, this idea of data minimization, right? One of the original motivations for saying, let's push computation out to client devices rather than pull data into a central server was the idea that if, if data resides on your personal device and you only reveal some minimal aspect of that data sufficient to perform a computation of interest, then inherently you get some stronger privacy protection than if, if you just share everything centrally. And while that's, that's certainly true, um, it, it does turn out that it's not necessarily sufficient to give a very strong privacy protection, right? So while we might only reveal some partial information, let's say the total number of visits a, a client device made to a website or some updates to a machine learning model rather than, than the full data that led to those updates. <clears throat> There's been many, many studies that show um, you can still learn something private and sensitive about an individual based on observing these, these kind of minimal data updates. So what we'll do when it comes to privacy and security is, is seek something much stronger than this. And just as a, um, as a parenthetical comment, we'll, throughout we'll assume that um, all the communication channels are encrypted, right? Encryption between a pair of communicating parties comes virtually for free these days. But we're, we're more interested in saying, well, outside, uh, outside of either end of that encrypted channel, what do participants learn? So in particular, if, if we're doing a federated computation with a server, what does that server learn about the participants or what can we learn from the output of that server? Okay, so something stronger than just minimizing data is a more formal notion of security that comes from secure multi-party computation, right? This is a big topic sufficient to merit a tutorial of its own. So, so as with many aspects of this tutorial, we'll just give a, a high level overview, right? So in, in the multi-party computation setting, we have multiple servers working together to compute some function of data. And in this case, the data comes from an even larger number of, of contributing clients. And the idea is that we'll split up the data into pieces so that no server really sees any complete piece of data. They only see a, what's called a share of, of the data and that share looks indistinguishable from random noise. The servers can then perform computations on those shares of data and work together to compute some function of interest so that they only reveal the result of that function without revealing any intermediate value, right? So this, this I think is perhaps sort of a minimal example of that. We have two clients who have a, a, a numeric value, a value X for client one and a value Y for client two. And what we want to do is compute 
the sum x plus y so that no one along the way, none of the servers and, and none of the other clients learn, learn the secret value of an individual client. So here's a very simple protocol that achieves that. So each client takes their data value and adds, adds a mask, adds essentially a randomly chosen numeric value to their data, or in this case, subtracts it. And they send the data minus the mask to one server and the mask to the other server. Right. So the servers receive these collection of, of masked shares of the data. And from, from the, the information they receive, they can't infer anything about the original values of X and Y, right? They just see X and Y perturbed with, with these uh, masks. So each server just sums up all the messages that it receives and outputs those sums. And then when you add those sums together, these masks cancel out. So the, the plus R mask cancels with the X minus R and just leaves X in the sum. Similarly for Y, and we get the, the result of, of these, we get the, the desired result, which is the sum without learning any intermediate values. All right, so that's that's a very simple example of multi-party computation. And so you could start to ask what more generally, what kind of computations can you do? Using this, this same idea of sharing out values, working with shares of, of the value shared across K different servers, then those servers can perform a variety of um, operations. So we, we saw addition, uh, subtraction works essentially the same way. Uh, you can also multiply by a public scalar value, right? So if I want to double a value, I just uh, multi double my shares and I get a share of double of the value. Um, that's, that's sufficient actually for a reasonable collection of, of tasks that you might want to do some very simple analytics or gathering statistics. For more complicated things, you want a broader value of operations. Uh, in particular, you'd like to be able to multiply two private values together. This you can do using some additional tricks using what are known as a beaver triples. Um, and then non-arithmetic operations, so comparisons, things like see, seeing whether, whether a value is greater or less than another value or picking the maximum of two values can be done in a slightly more complicated way using things like techniques that will convert an arithmetic share into a share of a binary representation. So as, as you can see, as we introduce more operations, things get a little bit more complicated. And, and particularly in the federated setting, there's a very interesting trade-off where we want to understand you know, how much power can we get from, from the expressiveness of computation versus how, how computationally efficient can that be to implement. So a, a special case of secure multi-party computation is, is something that's referred to in the literature as secure aggregation. So secure aggregation goes back to that first example we saw and says, what about if we want to compute the sum of values, in this case, maybe vectors, that are held by a collection of clients. Um, and this is a very powerful primitive, very simple, but very powerful. And it, it answers a lot of, of questions in federated computing. So there's been lots of effort put into different ways of realizing secure aggregation, and that can be done in various ways. So that can be done using that secure multi-party computation style protocol with two or more servers. But it can also be done using a single server and, and some extra tricks uh, with the client to manipulate the masks. And we'll dive into that in a few more slides time. Or you can implement it using different assumptions, right? So if, if you assume that you have a trusted entity that can perform the uh, aggregation, so a trusted server that maybe has some special hardware to support uh, trusted computation, um, we can delegate that to do the secure aggregation. And again, all of these different choices can plug into a federated computation setting and give you different trade-offs in, in terms of how much trust do you need, what additional infrastructure do you need, how robust are they to the, the presence or absence of clients dropping out during the protocol. So th those are some of the things we need from the security side to build federated computation. On the privacy side, we want to think a bit more about what's the right notion of, of privacy, right? So a starting point is one of the, the early definitions of privacy, canonymity, right? This is a, one, a, a notion of privacy that's been used very extensively uh, in the literature and in practice because it's very intuitive, right? You know, canonymity says that any output we produce 
So we think we're talking about the privacy of the final output here. Any output we produce should be well supported. What does well supported mean? It means that you know, anything we say in the output, there should be at least K individuals in the input that correspond to that output value, right? So a simple example might be if we're reporting population density over a, a, a map and we impose a set of grid cells and tell you how many people are in each grid cell, then let's say we'll, we'll either um, leave, each, leave a grid cell empty or to say that there are at least 10 people in there, right? We don't, we don't reveal information about fewer than 10 individuals in a cell. So that's that's very appealing, but but actually, we tend we we've realised in in recent years that this definition isn't quite satisfactory from a perspective of privacy, right? Intuitively, it it seems reasonable, but actually, you can easily find examples where you can learn information, private information about individuals, um, by combining uh, different data sets with chaonymous output. So. Although it might be a useful way of explaining privacy guarantees, for the most part, we actually prefer privacy definitions which have a, a stronger, more robust um, property. And that leads us to the state of the art, which is differential privacy. Right? Many of you will have seen differential privacy before. Right? It's a, a notion of statistical privacy that, that says you know, the, the output of an algorithm will be randomized. And so there'll be a distribution over outputs. And that distribution of output should look pretty similar to, to the output you would see if we just changed the contribution of one individual, right? So when we formalize that, we, we get this um, mathematical expression, um, which I've tried to, to use colors to kind of highlight what's going on, right? We have this notion of the probability of the algorithm applied to an input D giving a value in a particular set of outputs. And that should look pretty similar to the probability of the same algorithm giving the same outputs over a very similar data set, D prime. And that notion of similarity is captured by delta, which is a sort of a small additive probability. But most of the work here is being done by this term in epsilon, right? So think of e to the epsilon as just being a multiplicative factor that's hopefully quite close to one, right? That's capturing how close these two probabilities are. So that's a very sort of formal definition. How do we achieve differential privacy? So many, many papers have studied this question in the central case. And one of the common techniques to achieve differential privacy is that we compute our function exactly, um, uh, you know, apply our query of interest, and then add some statistical noise to that, where the noise is drawn, drawn for a distribution like the Laplace distribution or the Gaussian distribution, and we calibrate the magnitude of that noise based on um, this notion of sensitivity of the function, how much that function changes if we add or remove a single individual. So that's, that's this notion of differential privacy <clears throat> as it's explained in a, a centralized setting. When we move to the distributed setting of, of federated computation, we have some additional challenges, right? So before we even think about privacy, we've got to think about how do we decompose the computation of this function so that we can perform it over distributed inputs? And how do we ensure that the noise that we add is sufficient to mask, to achieve this differential privacy guarantee? And these, these two are intertwined, right? Because we might, think of a way to do distributed computation that's just not very compatible with noise addition for privacy uh, and vice versa. We might think of a, a way of adding noise for privacy, but relies on the central computation rather than the distributed computation of, of some statistical parameter. So within the federated setting, there's, there's several approaches, right? One is to reintroduce some trusted entity that can uh, compute some intermediate value and add noise there. Uh, and two other approaches are to add noise locally. So clients would add noise before they submit their, their values for aggregation in the federated setting or in distributed, distributed noise where clients add a very small amount of noise that adds up to give a sufficient overall privacy guarantee. So we see examples of both of these as we go on. For the first one, this notion of local noise addition or local differential privacy. Um, is, is a relative, hopefully an easy to understand uh, concept. Uh, 
it says that in a federated setting, we have lots of clients that are going to work together to compute some function of interest. And each client is going to um, produce a message based on their own input. But before they, they share that message uh, with others, they'll add some noise to that in such a way that the noise is sufficient to give a differential privacy guarantee. Right, so there's lots of ways to achieve this, but most of them relate to this, this central idea of randomized response that we mentioned very briefly already. Randomized response says uh, essentially that we can think of, of data as binary. So we have one or more bits of data and we will add noise by essentially um, flipping those bits with some appropriate probability. So if some small probability will flip a bit with um, majority probability will keep the bit as it was and then pass that noisy data off for aggregation. And this relatively simple idea is responsible for some of the largest deployments of federated analytics that we've seen uh, over previous years from, from Google, from Apple, Microsoft, and so on. Um, although one observation is that this the, the trend is moving away from local differential privacy um, because, because of the magnitude of the noise, right? Because um, each client adds enough noise to hide their own information, the total amount of noise added across all clients can become overwhelming. So um, there is a trend to look for other forms of privacy addition that don't, don't lead to as much noise as, as local differential privacy. Okay, so, so we're gonna sum up um, these definitions and then move on to look at them in practice, right? So we have this notion of privacy and security. Privacy where we're protecting the output of a computation, security where we want to secure the intermediate values during that computation. And often we want both of these, we want both security and privacy. Uh, privacy can be applied either in a central setting, so, so we do some secure aggregation and add, add noise based on a, a trusted entity. But we're also very interested in saying, how can we do this lo locally, either at full local noise or with distributed noise addition? And, and we'll see a bit more of those as we go on. And you know, often when we talk about an overall implementation of federated computation, we'll see um, you know, both privacy and security primitives being used in combination to give a, a fully um, protected um, system for evaluating a particular computation. Okay, so we'll, we'll move on and we'll start talking a bit more about some of the algorithms that, that implement this before I hand over and we talk some more about the, the systems and implementation issues that arise. So in, in most of this section, I'll, I'll talk about histograms, right? So what do I mean when I say histograms? Um, in this little example here, we've got 10 individuals who each have their favorite color. Some have favorite color blue, some have red, yellow. And what we want to do is build this table in the bottom right-hand side of the slide, right? We want to say that learn in, you know, without any perturbation, we would learn that there were six individuals whose favorite color was blue, one yellow, three red, right? And then for privacy, we might, think about perturbing this further because seeing only a single individual whose favorite color is yellow might be uh, privacy revealing. So this is the abstract notion of building a histogram and, and this is a pretty common um, task. Um, it's been very heavily studied under different models of privacy, um, centrally, locally and, and distributed differential privacy. And, and it's of interest, you know, partly just because it's a very fundamental way of describing data, right? If you have discrete data, then the histogram captures that and, and gives you essentially a probability distribution function of your population. But more generally, it's, it's the stepping stone to learning about other characteristics of data. So uh, answering queries about how many values fall in a particular range, uh, building quantiles, extracting, frequent items or heavy hitters, all based ultimately on, on building histograms. <clears throat> so to spell this out, we'll, we'll revisit four different privacy security models over the next 20 minutes or so, and show how we can build histograms in each of those different models. 
uh, achieving a different privacy or security uh, guarantee. So let's, let's step back to um, secure aggregation. Um, remember, we already saw a way of doing secure aggregation on, on data that we could add up uh, to get the sum. Well, essentially, the way to get histograms will depend on the same notion of, of summing things up to get the sum. But here we're going to look at secure aggregation where we only have one server. So it's a security model where we have one aggregator rather than multiple servers uh, collaborating. Right, so, so what we do is we, we think of each client as having a, a data, data value which corresponds to a vector, and we want to compute this sum of all vectors. And, and in addition, we want to be able to tolerate the fact that over the course of this computation, some clients might go offline, right? They might just run out of battery or enter a, a network dead zone. And so we can't guarantee that clients that start the protocol will necessarily be there at the end. Okay. So mathematically, how this protocol works is each client is going to pick K neighbors, so K other clients to cooperate with at random. And these neighbors, so, so client I and client J, who decide their neighbors, are going to agree a mask value Mij, and, and correspondingly a mask Mji. The, these are complementary, so Mij plus Mji sums up to zero. And in addition, they're also going to each client I is going to share out to its neighbors information about an additional um, private mask Ri. Okay. So what's, what's the protocol? The protocol after this setup stage is that the client I will send the message of their data plus their private mask, plus the sum of the, the shared masks between all of the neighbors that they chose, right? So what, what does this achieve? If, if every client stays present, then the server will receive these values and they can compute the sum of all these messages. What they'll get is they'll get the sum of all the data values X plus all those private masks R, but these neighbor masks, these pair masks will cancel out because Mij plus Mji cancel out to zero, right? So you get the sum that you want plus these private masks R, and then the server goes back to the neighbors of I and says, please send me the shares of this mask. So that gives the server enough information to remove the mask from the sum. But on the other hand, if a client drops out midway through this protocol, um, so that let's say we never actually receive their message, we still need to remove these, these shards of their shared masks from the neighboring um, clients. So what we'll do, is we'll get the server to request information on those from, from the neighbors of I and, and hence be able to remove them from the sums. So the key thing here is in either case, um, no matter how the, the clients um, remain or depart, if, if enough clients stick around, right, and we expect the majority of them will, then there's enough information here to complete this procedure and remove all of the mask information and only end up with the sum. The key thing, the key reason that we have these sort of two kinds of masks, the, the, sh the shared pairwise masks and the individual masks, is the server is only allowed from any individual to collect information on one of those. Either a server gets a share of an R value or the server gets a share of an M value. This, this ensures that um, the server can't abuse the protocol and learn about any individual's private data. Okay, so that's that's sort of the rough outline. Then, then a few more details. In in particular, to implement this, we often use a generalized version of secret sharing called threshold secret sharing, that ensures that um, essentially you don't need all neighbors to participate. You can retrieve the shared value provided t out of the k neighbors for some threshold t still participate. And then when you plug this in, essentially the, the paper that introduces this shows that the overall protocol will succeed. That is that you'll correctly recover the sum and not reveal any, any secret information, provided not too many neighbors collude with the server, um, that this graph of, of neighbors remains correct, connected after we remove clients that either drop out or are considered corrupt, and that each node has at least T of their neighbors surviving after dropouts, where again, T is this threshold value. 
And it turns out with a bit of um, randomized analysis of algorithms that we only need to choose K to be logarithmically large. Um, so logarithmic in the size of the um, total number of participants um, to ensure that all these properties hold with high probability and hence we can compute the sum securely and only have a very small logarithmic overhead to keep track of, of all this um, additional information. So that gives you a protocol for, for secure aggregation how, uh, for summing up vectors. How do you use that for histograms? Very easily, really, that um, you can think of the vector that a client might want to um, report as being a one-hot encoding of a label, right? They have a label out of a set of possible values and they send a one corresponding to that label and a zero elsewhere in the vector. Then we add these up and we get exactly the histogram of those label frequencies. Right. There are a few extensions that it's worth mentioning. So when the, the, the size of the set of possible labels gets very big, then this can be unwieldy, but there are some tricks to allow more compact encoding of, of sparse vectors. And there are some more general extensions coming from the security community, how you might ensure um, things like honesty in the client. So make sure each client really is just voting for one possible label rather than multiple labels. Okay. So that was talking about how we can do secure aggregation, how we can implement secure aggregation um, to get a security guarantee for a uh, for for this um, histogram construction problem. What about if we want to give some additional privacy guarantee? So a starting point is a local privacy guarantee. So remember, this is when each client is going to perturb their, their information so to give a, a differentially private guarantee over their, what they report. And this is probably the most heavily studied question in, in local differential privacy. So lots of techniques have been proposed. And essentially these, these work depending on the size of the domain. So when you have a very small domain, some very simple techniques will work based on randomized response or generalizing randomized response a little bit more. As we go to larger domains, techniques based on hashing come to the fore. So ones where we use a, a, hashing, a hash function to reduce the cardinality of the domain, learn information about the reduced size domain, and then map that back to the original domain. And again, the, these have been used fairly extensively for identifying malicious URLs or tracking information uh, about app usage um, from Google and Apple systems. So, so just sort of a quick overview of some of the different techniques that have been used here for locally differentially private histograms. Um, so techniques based on unary encoding might be easiest to understand. So, so here in the top right, again, you can think of a one hot encoding of a user's input. And what we can do is just look at each bit in that encoding and apply randomized response, right? So with some small probability, we'll flip a zero to a one, we'll flip a one to a zero. And this has the effect of um, introducing uncertainty on every single bit, and that's sufficient to build up the histogram, right? The direct encoding approach says, well, if we have D possible labels, um, another way of generalizing randomized response is to say, I'll keep the true label with some probability P, but with some lower probability, I'll uniformly pick one of the other labels, right? And you can then take these two probability expressions, um, apply the differential privacy guarantee, rearrange and solve. And what this gets is um, a way of setting this, this perturbation probability so that we get uh, a differential privacy guarantee in terms of the parameter epsilon and the domain size D. And lastly, hashing-based approaches, um, do this technique of picking a public hash function, so a hash function that will be shared publicly, and applying that public hash function to the private data. So we map um, the user's input from, let's say, d different options down to just, say, two. Then we apply some additional perturbation to that. So again, some unary encoding or direct encoding of that hashed down value and report that. And that's 
that information along with the hash function is sufficient for, for the aggregator to make some, um, to compute some unbiased estimations of what that user's contribution was, sum those over all, all clients, and we get uh, an unbiased estimate for the histogram. So as we said before, you know, local differential privacy is very attractive. It's, it's very um, sort of statistically clear to understand and, and gives a strong guarantee, but often we may want to reduce the, the magnitude of the noise. So that moves to techniques for privacy where we do distributed noise generation. Um, and the basic idea here is, is hopefully a relatively simple one. Um, so here, instead of having every user add a large amount of noise sufficient to mask their own data, what if each user adds a small amount of noise, right? So for example, if each user adds a Gaussian, a value sample from a Gaussian distribution with a very small variance, if we think about adding up those noisy messages, so we add up the, these combinations of data plus small amount of noise, what you get is the sum of the data plus um, all of these small noises, which add up to a Gaussian with um, a larger variance, right? So if we calibrate this so that this Gaussian with, with larger variance is exactly the noise we would add for differential privacy in the central case, then, then we've achieved distributed noise generation. And so a lot of the work in, in distributed noise generation over the last couple of years has just been in looking at different distributions that have this property, that have this summability property, that work in different settings. Right. So again, we can do the same kind of trick we, we did before to get a histogram. We can take the user's individual histogram, which is a one hot encoding, add a, a very small amount of noise to each cell and then securely combine these. So, so use secure aggregation to get the sum of all these noised reports. So that will work perfectly because the output of this will be noised with a sufficiently large amount of, of noise to give a differential privacy guarantee. And the only caveat here, the only, the only drawback is that secure aggregation is usually defined to work over integer values or discrete values, right? So we need to make sure that the noise we add is also discrete. And that moves us to look at various kinds of discrete noise distribution. Now, I'll just mention very briefly here, there's a lot of connection here to the, the recent work on achieving privacy via what's called shuffling. So, so essentially using some notion of a, of a shuffler to remove identifying information about um, where each message comes from. Uh, and in many cases, you can, you can view a result in shuffle privacy uh, in terms of effectively being a, a, a mechanism for distributed noise generation. So I'll just briefly mention that there, there have been several works recently that go in further detail into how do you generate distributed noise for the purpose of federated computation. So things like the Skellum mechanism, which you can think of as a sort of discrete version of the Gaussian distribution, which has a nice compact um, representation in terms of Poisson distributions, uh, and a more customized uh, ARET distribution, which tries to give an optimal um, noise distribution for the high privacy setting. So depending on you know, the nature of the noise and depending on the, the pr privacy setting, you want different kinds of noise distribution. So last, I, I promised four different uh, techniques to histograms. So the last technique is one that Akash and I developed recently, where it, it works in a somewhat different security model to the others that we've seen. But it aims to say, you know, can we give privacy guarantees without explicit noise addition, but rather with, with noise that comes implicitly from a sampling operator, right? So what we argue in, in this paper is that if you sample a subset of clients with a suitably chosen probability P uh, and we'll build the exact histogram, except that we then delete from this histogram any element whose count is less than a threshold tau, then provided we choose P and tau appropriately, we'll give an epsilon delta guarantee on the output of this. Right? And the reason I say this is a different security um, model is because in addition to needing security around the collection of the 
um, the histogram, we also need security around the thresholding, right? So we only get the differential privacy guarantee on the output if it's you can't see any of the intermediate steps, you only see the thresholded output and you don't get to see who, um, who participated in the sampling. Okay. So I've talked about four different ways that you can build histograms. Once you have histograms in the federated setting, what good do they do you? What else can you do? All right. So a lot of other analytic tasks are built on top of being able to, to materialize a histogram. So things like heavy hitters, where we want to find the items that occur most commonly in the input data, or prefix queries, where if we have an ordering on our domain items, we want to be able to sum up a prefix of items, a prefix of counts of items under that ordering, or more generally, sum up a range of items within that ordering. Uh, and those in turn connect to the idea of quantiles. So given a collection of items from this ordered domain, we want to find the median, or more generally percentiles of the data distribution. So I'll, I'll go in detail on the heavy hitters technique um, and sort of show, show this worked example. So let's say we've got data held by our clients, which corresponds to strings, right? Some have the, the string sun, some have the string moon, some have stars, some have Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Venus, whatever. And we want to know which are the, the most popular strings held by our client population, right? So the reason this is a challenging problem is just the, the domain of possible strings can be very large, right? You've got the entire dictionary if, if you want uh, single words, but more generally, if you're looking at URLs or you're looking at sentences, you know, the number of possible strings can quickly become unboundedly large. So this, this incremental search introduces the idea of federated computation with multiple rounds, right? So in the first round, we would go out and say to our clients, contribute to a histogram of the popular first characters of strings, right? And what we might find from this is the characters S and the character M are very popular first uh, characters. Maybe the character Z or X very unpopular. So we would ignore those, those two. We just look at S and we look at the character M and then we'd say, okay, so in round two, we want to go back and, and collect a new histogram. Now we want to collect a histogram of all two character um, strings, but only those that begin with the character S or the character M, right? So what you can see in, in round two is that we would learn that ST and SU are popular prefixes, MO is a popular prefix. And then this lets us iterate, right? So in round three, you extend by another character, round four, uh, another character, and so on. And by looking at what comes back from these histograms as, as popular, we're able to read off that the strings sun and moon are both popular, but we didn't quite get to star, right? You can see that a prefix of star was popular, but maybe you know, not, enough, um, not enough clients had R in the next place, so we cut off that line of inquiry. So this kind of tree search shows how you can use the histogram primitive across multiple rounds to build up more complex information and also shows that you know, it's very natural in the federated setting to, to go from sort of single rounds of interaction to multiple rounds of interaction in order to gather more information. So other things that you can do once you have histograms, you can answer those range queries essentially by using this, this sort of picture, right? You impose a tree over your domain where each node corresponds to a collection of, of items from your domain and you associate a weight with each node so that you can then compute any range query by summing up the weights associated with a minimal cover uh, of nodes that cover your range of interest. Once you have range queries, then you can answer quantile queries because you can find the median by saying what, what is the prefix range that has approximately half the weight associated with it. Um, you can also move on to other kind of more statistical queries. Um, marginals are essentially histograms, right? They're, they're empirical histograms of frequency distributions. 
and more generally other kinds of graphical models you can usually express in terms of linear functions of input frequencies. So histograms are very powerful. Um, what are some of the other things that people have looked at in the federated setting um, to answer various kinds of analytics queries? Sums, counts, and means are also very important. And we can answer, we can identify these um, in a number of different ways. <clears throat> so let's, let's assume that every client has a single scalar value and we want to compute the mean across this population of clients. Uh, and further, just to keep things simple, we can assume that the data is a real value in the range zero to one, right? So rounding approaches are very popular. So with probability, so if, if the client has a value of 0 0.9, then with probability 0 0.9, we'll round that up to one. And otherwise with probability 0 0.1, we'll round it down to zero. That gives you sort of an unbiased estimator, right? If you take the, the, the sum of all of those rounded client reports, then you'll get an expectation, um, the true mean. And then to give privacy, you can additionally use some kind of noise addition, say randomized response on that result. A more sophisticated approach is called subtractive dithering, which does something somewhat similar, but now this time it's you pick a threshold for rounding um, uniformly at random. Um, technique we developed recently just more directly looks at the bits in a fixed precision representation of the value that a client might have and uses those to uh, report and reconstruct information on the mean. Um, and most recently, there's been an interesting work which aims to define a probability matrix such that if, if you use this probability matrix to sample an output given an input value, you will get differential privacy because of the design of the matrix, but also then the matrix is optimized to minimize the variance um, in the representation to give an unbiased estimator with minimal variance. So all of these techniques let you trade off different combinations of, of the amount of communication and the, the accuracy that you get in reconstructing the mean against, a, say, a fixed privacy guarantee. And that's for a scalar mean. You can then think of uh, <clears throat> generalizing this to a vector mean. And typically the way that you generalize this to a vector mean is, is you simply apply scalar transformations to each component of your vector independently. But more sophisticated techniques look at, at more complex transformations of the vector. And this is a key component of <clears throat> a key component of federated learning. Right. So many techniques for federated learning are based on um, this federated notion of um, computing averages over vectors, where these, these vectors are either directly gradients coming from clients that are going to be used to update a model, or they may in fact be um, updates from clients that have been uh, computed over multiple steps of gradient descent. So then within the, the federated learning setting, Vector averaging is the primitive that you need, and this is often combined with um, a few other steps. So you may um, perform some clipping, right? So clipping is used primarily in conjunction with differential privacy to ensure that um, we can bound the magnitude of the noise that's added um, because we, we correspondingly bound the magnitude of, of any co coordinate contributing to the, the gradient update. And you know, it's, people have been looking a lot at exactly what kind of noise addition is needed to give an overall privacy guarantee in conjunction with, with various different techniques for keeping track of the privacy budget over multiple iterations of um, this gradient descent approach. So, so just to summarize this, this brief tour of algorithms in the federated setting, um, we said before that you were in a complex trade-off here because we're trading off different notions of privacy and security against what are the computational costs on clients or the computational costs on servers and the communication costs between them. And, and in addition, we have you know, questions about what's the accuracy we get, right? Do we get an exact answer or more typically, we get some answer that has some noise due to privacy and what overall accuracy guarantee do we get 
based on on that noise addition. Right? So we have lots of questions to think about, like you know, in any particular instantiation, what kind of noise are we adding to give privacy, and and where are we adding it to? What are we adding that privacy noise? How are we picking uh, a primitive that gives us a certain security guarantee and combining that with the the privacy noise addition? Um, and then in aggregate, we didn't look a great deal at this, but an important question is to understand what overall accuracy and computational costs can we guarantee for this procedure. So we looked um, at a high level at histograms and some of the applications to, to related analytics. We also touched on mean computation, uh, and these can be generalized to things like variance and, and higher moments. So at this point, I'll, I'll pause there. Um, and hand back to a cache who'll switch to a more applied perspective on how we build systems to uh, implement federated computation. Thanks, Graham. Uh, just uh, give me a second. Uh, great, uh, thanks, Graham. Uh, so now that we have an understanding of the fundamentals uh, of a system for federated computation, as well as some of the algorithms used to implement those fundamentals, uh, let's talk about practical considerations that come up when you try to deploy it in production. So federated computation has moved beyond an academic solution concept and has been implemented in production uh, by Google, Meta, uh, Apple, uh, IBM, Microsoft, and so on and so forth. Uh, however, most of these systems tend to focus on federated learning. Uh, federated analytics is more of an up and coming type of uh, subject area. Uh, so in terms of federated analytic systems themselves, uh, they don't get to, uh, they typically aren't talked about as much, uh, but uh, they, they actually have wider deployments than federated learning systems simply because uh, measurements tend to be a lot more plentiful than uh, model training opportunities. So some examples of these systems are uh, Google's rapport system, which handles all of the client side analytics that relies on metrics emanating from Google Chrome browsers. Uh, similarly, we have Apple's own uh, differential privacy deployment and Microsoft's uh, telemetry solution. All of these systems tend to rely on uh, providing local differential privacy guarantees. Uh, however, as Graham pointed out, uh, local differential privacy has been criticized for offering a poor trade-off between accuracy and privacy, which is the fundamental trade-off involved here. Uh, in other words, results are too noisy, especially when you're dealing with relatively smaller scale deployments, which might happen, for example, for new product launches. So this uh, necessitates the need for new approaches, uh, potentially those relying on distributed noise generation uh, that, that also happen to rely on secure aggregation, uh, both of which we cover covered in the, the, the previous sections. So uh, in designing these new types of uh, systems, a lot of challenges come up, uh, some of which we've already covered. For example, how do you perform these computations in a distributed and private way? Uh, how do you deal with clients who may be slow or who drop out? How do you deal with malicious actors who are actively trying to compromise the accuracy of uh, the solution or compromise the system in some way? What sort of privacy model do you adopt? How do you budget privacy? How do you deal with uh, distributional issues in the data? Uh, and different levels of scale, so on and so forth. Now, this looks like a scary list, but luckily not all of these issues occur all of the time. And so over the course of the next few slides, I'll cherry pick some of these and talk about uh, ways of navigating some of these challenges. So, so the first couple of challenges I'll talk about uh, involve choosing an appropriate level of privacy granularity and budgeting privacy. So recall that uh, the differential, pri a differential privacy guarantee can be provided at different levels, uh, a group level, user level, device level, event level, and so on. Uh, and in practice, this can, this can depend on a lot of different factors. Uh, for example, it could just depend on the nature of the data itself. Uh, if you're dealing with messaging data or geneal genealogical data, uh, the data is just innately shared amongst multiple users, and you may even have a legal burden to uh, provide a group level privacy guarantee. Uh, it could also uh, it could also depend on the trust model that you've chosen. Uh, for example, 
if your trust model does not admit uh, a secure aggregator or a trusted third party that can uh, perform an aggregation, uh, it, it may be impractical to claim a group or user level privacy guarantee because that might require uh, the joining or intersection uh, of data from multiple devices or multiple users where the user devices have to be observed. Uh, so you might have to back off to uh, a, a finer granularity of, of, of a privacy guarantee. Uh, another aspect is just the sensitivity of the query itself, which Graham talked about earlier. Uh, essentially, this is you know how much of a contribution uh, can you know one users or one devices or one events data uh, make uh, to the result of a query. Uh, essentially, the coarser the level of granularity, uh, the higher that sensitivity tends to be, uh, and the higher the level of sensitivity, the more the amount of noise that you need to add to provide a privacy guarantee, and the more noise that you add, the less accurate the results tend to get. Uh, now, there are different ways to deal with this. One way could be to just clip these contributions, but you know that has issues of its own. Uh, and the other way is you might just devolve to a final level of, of privacy granularity when uh, making a promise to uh, users. The other big issue is privacy budgeting. So intuitively, the more often you, uh, a user makes data disclosures, the more uh, privacy they lose. Uh, and, uh, given enough time and enough number of disclosures, uh, any kind of privacy guarantee becomes meaningless because the user has made sufficient number of uh, disclosures for us to learn uh, a whole bunch about themselves. Uh, and thinking in terms of differential privacy, uh, appealing to composition rules of differential privacy, essentially each time a disclosure is made, it's like adding the epsilons up. Um, so in practice, the way we deal with this is we tend to refresh privacy budgets at some sen a sensible cadence. Uh, for example, if you're uh, if you if you have a whole bunch of queries that uh, seek to establish the number of daily active users for a suite of uh, uh, web apps uh, or mobile apps that people tend to be using, across a number of web apps that pe uh, folks are using, uh, it, it makes sense to refresh the privacy budget on a daily basis because we're tracking daily active users. Uh, similarly, if you happen to have strong data separations between the data produced by each of these web apps, uh, then perhaps you could uh, account uh, privacy separately for each of these web apps, uh, which minimizes the overall epsilon. Uh, another issue that comes, comes up is the availability of clients to participate in the federated computation protocol uh, and latency issues which come up, which could just be because of delays in the network or even network outages. So, so let's deal with the first of these, which is the availability of clients. Uh, so oftentimes this is something that we restrict purposely. For example, we might say that uh, we only want devices that are on Wi-Fi or that are charging to participate in the protocol because uh, uh, the actual local computations themselves might be quite heavy or uh, the amount of data being communicated might be fairly large. Uh, and, and this might limit the devices that uh, participate in the protocol and introduce sampling biases of its own. Uh, and this can be sampling biases, both in terms of what data is logged, uh, as well as which devices and which types of users participate themselves. Uh, so in practice, the way you deal with this is ensuring that on-device logging is lightweight enough to happen outside of this window of eligibility that we set. Uh, and the other uh, strategy is to uh, choose eligibility criteria that are as permissive as possible. The other big issue that comes up is latency and dropouts. Uh, essentially, since these client devices uh, come in and out of the network at the will of the user or based on how network topologies change, uh, it could be the case that uh, responses as part of the federated computation protocol uh, are delayed or just never uh, come in at all. Uh, and, and the way you deal with this is uh, either by provision, uh, sampling a larger number of clients than is necessary and just discarding the uh, extra data disclosures, or by devising asynchronous algorithms that don't wait on clients to check in quickly, uh, or alternatively by devising dropout tolerant algorithms, uh, an example of which is uh, uh, the secure aggregation protocol that uh, Graham described in the previous section. Uh, another set of issues arises because of uh, uh, the distributional issues of the data itself. Uh, there are four of these that come to mind, the first of which is how the data is distributed across devices. Uh, you could have power users, for example, who uh, have uh, a, a disproportionate number of uh, data records locally, uh, 
Uh, and then this leads to the question of should such data rich clients uh, be reduced to a single record by some kind of sampling or aggregation uh, mechanism locally. Uh, and an issue that we must avoid here is, you know, Simpson's paradox. Um, another issue is uh, where each of the local data distributions uh, are distinct, uh, even though in aggregate it might conform to some uh, uh, typical uh, parametric data distribution. Uh, and usually the way you deal with this is just by sampling a sufficiently large number of clients that these local uh, data distribution variations kind of vanish in the aggregate. Um, another common issue is skewness, where uh, a lot of local data values might be drawn from long tail distributions. Uh, and typically what we do here is clip or truncate those distributions uh, to avoid these outliers. Uh, and the last major issue that comes up is non-stationarity. Uh, where the data on the uh, produced by clients might itself change over time. Uh, the distribution of that data might change over time. Uh, so the way you deal with this is by avoiding long-lived queries, uh, uh, maintaining snapshots of data and uh, referring to the right snapshot in order to avoid this distributional shift, uh, or by, just by using asynchronous adaptive federated algorithms that can deal with this type of non-stationary issue. Uh, and with that, we move on to the final section of uh, the tutorial, which is advanced topics and open problems. Uh, so the easiest way to extend existing work is to develop new primitives. Uh, and some of the most requested ones are uh, uh, mechanisms for conducting private hypothesis tests. Uh, and the key issue here is adjusting the test in light of the privacy noise in order to avoid any bias and to minimize the variance of the estimates that you produce. Um, another common request is distributional comparisons across different populations of clients, uh, or even uh, populations of clients across time. Uh, and uh, the, the, the last uh, additional request that, that I can think of is uh, building simple graphical models or regression models that aim to capture some kind of causal relationship. Uh, this could be done through uh, gradient descent type approaches, which uh, resembles more federated learning. Uh, but it's still an open question whether this can be done more cheaply than that using uh, simpler statistics that can be evaluated using, evaluated using federated analytics. Uh, another aspect is that a tacit assumption we've made so far is uh, in all, all these federated computation protocols, uh, there is no need for the joining or intersection of data across user devices. But you could uh, conceive of queries, for example, finding uh, the shortest path in some graph where each client holds some subset of the edges. Uh, and this type of query requires this uh, joining or aggregation of data across the client devices. Uh, and how this could be done in the federated setting with these robust privacy guarantees is still an open question. Also, uh, we, we could develop a, hardened models of differential privacy, which uh, defend against, for example, malicious servers or cheating clients that are actively trying to uh, diminish the utility or install backdoors uh, uh, that compromise uh, the integrity of the system. Uh, and additionally, we could also try to derive tighter privacy bounds by devising advanced privacy accountants or uh, appealing to de definitions of Rennie differential privacy. Uh, another set of issues deals with uh, longitudinal studies as opposed to cross-sectional studies. So for example, what, is it, uh, what should the result of a query be when the underlying data itself is changing? Uh, also, when we deal with the streaming scenario as opposed to the batch analytics scenario, can a long-running federated analytics query keep the results up to date? And what's the optimal way to do that? Uh, also, how do you budget privacy uh, and manage the privacy uh, in the longitudinal setting? Uh, and uh, can you devise adaptive algorithms in order to deal with distributional shifts over time, uh, uh, kind of related to that non-stationarity issue that I talked about earlier. Uh, another big gap is the lack of suitable tooling uh, uh, that can be used off the shelf. For example, it would be great to have production grade uh, uh, open source systems uh, to support federated computation. Uh, that also have high level query languages that allow you to combine various uh, uh, analytical primitives uh, to achieve complex uh, uh, outputs uh, and uh, expose those outputs through a user interface that makes it easy to launch these tasks and also understand the fundamental trade-offs between privacy and utility. 
so far, we've talked about federated analytics, but there's a whole suite of challenges which come up in uh, for federated learning as well. Uh, so this is a, a, a list of those from uh, Peter Kairos's paper in 2021. Uh, and we see some familiar suspects here, uh, for example, uh, improving the con uh, convergence communication trade-off, uh, having tighter privacy bounds, uh, defending against uh, malicious attackers, uh, developing asynchronous algorithms, uh, and in the case of federated learning, uh, another important consideration is compressing the size of the, uh, of the machine learning models themselves, because constantly sending these out to devices can take up a lot of bandwidth, as well as space and compute locally. Uh, so th this is clearly a fertile ground for uh, future research. Uh, additionally, federated learning and federated analytics have a bit of a symbiotic relationship. Uh, for example, federated analytics could be used to support feature selection, feature normalization, model calibration, uh, A-B testing to choose which models you deploy, uh, as well as to support debugging. Uh, you know, for example, if your model just uh, doesn't converge in, in production, uh, or you know, if there's some subtle uh, sampling bias that has been introduced or some kind of sampling bug, uh, the way you typically detect that is by using something like federated analytics. Uh, so in summary, federated computation is an emerging model for secure private distributed computation. Uh, it allows the data to remain on user devices, but it allows us to sort of have our cake and eat it too, because we can still train uh, highly competent machine learning models and evaluate uh, analytical queries of great interest while still providing robust privacy protections that rise to meet regulatory restrictions uh, and also assuage the fears of uh, lay people who have uh, sensitivities towards privacy. Uh, federated learning is perhaps the most popular incarnation of uh, federated computation, uh, but other forms of federated computation such as analytics uh, are on the cusp of impact and uh, arguably have uh, experienced wider deployment than federated learning itself. Uh, and this entire field is fertile ground for future research, uh, and it involves contributions from a lot of different subfields, such as multi-party computation, differential privacy, and distributed computing. Uh, and uh, it, there are many open pro uh, problems that uh, could benefit from novel algorithms uh, that folks like you could come up with. Uh, we hope you enjoyed that tutorial, and uh, we're happy to take any questions at this point. Thank you. Thanks everyone. So just uh, if you have a question, just uh, <clears throat> unmute, far away. And if not, I guess everyone understood everything perfectly uh, and the, all problems are now solved. So I'll, I'll, I'll maybe throw in a question just to, uh, to seed um see the conversation um so I, I guess you know one thing people are always interested to know is what are the most um impactful applications of a technology like this what what are some of the um example or sort of hypothetical use cases um that could be useful at web scale for for collecting data and, and achieving a privacy guarantee like this yeah, so I'm kind of limited in the sense that I can't. Talk about <laughs> I, I said hypothetical. <laughs> yeah, I, I, at Meta, but I can talk about what some of our uh, peer companies have done. Uh, so uh, Google has deployed uh, federated learning uh, to train uh, their smart keyboard models. So this is the model that predicts the ne next word that you're likely to type, given everything you've typed so far. Uh, and uh, they've obtained double digit uh, percentage improvements in the click through rate for these uh, models. Uh, Apple similarly has used federated learning to train wake word detection models and automatic speech recognition models. Uh, Google has its rapport system that handles all of the client side analytics that relies on data that emanates out of uh, Chrome browsers, which all of us use. Uh, so these are all uh, examples of wide scale deployments of federated computation uh, that have been highly impactful. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, on my side, you know, what I find very interesting here is you know, that there is a lot of focus on federated learning, but it, it tends to be quite narrowly on, you know, how do you do that training step? How do you do the gradient descent or, or similar training for a model? Um, 
but my my sort of belief based on the examples that I've seen is is that we do need this broader view of federated computation um, that um, many of, of the upcoming tasks that, that people want to address are ones that, that have an element of machine learning um, that needs to be trained in a federated sense. But in addition, it's you know, we need to think about how do we do that feature selection or how do we track statistics on the, the classifier once it's deployed to check that it's it's still achieving the same level of accuracy and, and so on. And so you know this this distinction that is sometimes used between federated analytics and federated learning is, is I think just a sort of a temporary thing based on our current view of the world and we'll move towards this more holistic view of, of federated computation, um, particularly as, as we see lots more examples of companies that, that can deploy this, right, you know, app, via apps or via sort of um, browsers to, to compute um, privately uh, useful information. Yeah, any other questions from around the room? Uh, as we said before, um, if you want to get hold of the slides, they're on the website for this tutorial. Uh, you can find the website, I guess, either by doing a web search or going through the um, agenda for the conference, and there should be a link out to the website, um, and you'll be able to get slides, uh, references, and uh, reach out to us with any individual queries. Uh, there's a question posted in the chat, which I'm going to have to pause. Uh, what do you think issues such as higher error rates, high variation delay and jitter in wireless network environments would affect federated computation? So that's that's a really interesting question. So I must admit that, that all of my thinking about federated computation has been under an assumption of reliable networks. So you know, one, one way to answer that is we just assume that we have um you know a suitable uh, network layer that will um handle re, re, um, retransmission and error correction um one one thing i have seen recently um is i have seen sort of some initial efforts that say you know what about federated computation where you use the network itself as the medium of aggregation so essentially you might take take advantage of some uh, sort of radio effects so that um essentially messages from clients would um, uh, would would add together uh, implicitly through the through the medium and uh, an observer could then then sort of just directly read off the aggregation it seems outside my area of expertise to know know about that um, but generally I, I guess all of these issues around delays dropouts jitter are definitely valid so so one could move you know a lot of our examples are sort of implicitly um in in the setting of um uh, like mobile communication like um, mobile phone smartphones um moving this to a sort of a, a lighter weight setting something more like sensor networks would be really interesting radio networks um and and i feel that you know lots of Lots of interesting coding questions will come up there. So it's it's uh, as far as I know, it's it's an open topic. Um, it will be very cool to work some more on. Um, so housekeeping question uh, was saying where will the video uh, come from? Um, if I'm guessing it'll be done through the uh, the conference itself. Um, but yes, they they are recording this. So after they. Um, chop out uh, some of the uh, um, dead time at the start, then hopefully that'll be posted on YouTube or some other platform. Okay, <laughs> and, and, and a, a, a really great open question posted in the chat. What might be the next most important breakthroughs to be made for federated computation in the near future in terms of foundational research and real world applications? That's a very open question. <laughs> Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll take a first swing at that. 
Um, and it's it's probably going to depend a lot on the people in this room to uh, everyone who's who's dialed in to come up with with the new things. Um, big impact, open questions. I think for for me, the obvious thing is is to extend the applicability. Um, so to go from sort of relatively simple computations based on on sort of sums, counts, averages, into more general purpose computations so so how how general purpose can we make it so that you know someone can just come along and register a query with a federated computation system uh, to be able to kind of compile that and send that out to uh, to client devices um, i could see there'd be a lot of work here on lower bounds so showing what's either what's not possible or at least what requires a lot of communication to achieve uh, complementing some of the work that's been done in distributed computing on, on lower bounds outside of privacy. And, and for real world applications, I think just, just seeing this get more into practice. So, so again, without, without sort of divulging any confidential information, I can just say sort of within a single company, our, our organization, Meta, we, we just see a lot of different applications, a lot of people reaching out saying, hey, we're looking at this kind of application or this kind of statistics gathering, we recognize and we appreciate, you know, the need to be very cautious and, and the need to give privacy guarantees, um, but also the, the need to give um, as accurate as possible statistics back to um, downstream users. How can we use techniques from federated computation as, as part of that workflow? Um, so I, I think you know the real world applications are just going to be many and, and varied, um, and and maybe the the chief thing that will be interesting for me is to see sort of what's the next step. When does this move from something being pioneered by the big tech companies into something that's actually more mainstream and you know organisations, government organisations, uh, charitable organisations, and so on also feel that this is a, a useful set of technologies to um, perform private distributed computation in. Yeah, and I guess if I could just uh, add to that, uh, uh, another aspect that, he, that we didn't spend as much time on, in part because it really isn't a, a solved problem, is how do you deal with uh, a scenario where you have malicious actors in the system? Uh, so once your data becomes interesting enough and once you become dominant enough in your space, this is something that you have to worry about. And uh, there can be a lot of subtle ways in which people can compromise your systems. Uh, and they could have different goals in doing this. They could just want to tank the utility of whatever queries you're evaluating. But, you know, uh, a more dangerous thing could be, uh, for example, installing a backdoor to maybe uh, get around some integrity or security checks that you might have in place. Uh, and dealing with these is incredibly important uh, in practice. Also, the fundamental trade-off that we've identified in this set of uh, slides that we've gone over is between privacy and utility. Uh, but in practice, it could also trade off against other things. For example, fairness, which is uh, you could have minority populations uh, uh, whose contributions to uh, whatever statistical query you're uh, evaluating could be uh, eliminated just in the noise, uh, and they could be end up being further underrepresented. Uh, so, how do you trade off, say, privacy against something like fairness? Uh, is is another uh, issue that that could come up. Uh, also, uh, one more concern could be that uh, federated computation is uh, intrinsically wasteful uh, because it's a protocol that involves potentially sending out large machine learning models or uh, incurring multiple rounds of communication between large numbers of devices and uh, either a secure aggregator and, and a server. So how do you minimize that computational complexity? How do you reduce the uh, resource usage on the devices themselves, uh, especially since we don't own those devices and they're really heterogeneous and we can't really make too many assumptions of them. Uh, these are all also, I think, uh, valid and incredibly useful areas of research. And we haven't really solved all of the problems involved there. Cool. So I think we, we're coming up to the end of our slot. Um,
I hope everyone enjoys the rest of the conference. Um, and like I said before, if you have any follow up questions or clarification things we, we talked about, then feel free to reach out over email. We'll be happy to respond. Otherwise, thanks a lot for your attention today. And yeah, have a great rest of the conference. Thank you. See you guys.